continue on the same, but do it again later? No, we'll do this is a lesson, and we'll maybe take it. So they won't get it. That's a no. Again, I, like I said, it's pretty much circling back a little bit on some of the stuff we've covered before, but you might not recognize it as such. This is more of an extra credit one, or for all you star students. So let's just start <laughs> with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the the sometimes what looks like a frowning providence um, and the difficulties in this community and the region, some of the things that have hit very close to home for some of our dear brethren in this church, um, the, the ripple effect of all of those things, the, the lingering aroma of fire in the air and all of those things which come to this moment and this lesson. I just pray that you would help it all to be a part of something you use to you threads that you weave into a tapestry that show us with more clarity and a better um, resetting and calibrating of our hearts for seeing all of what's around us through Trinitarian eyes. We pray that you'd be with us this morning, that this discussion, although it's again through some kind of dry as twigs kind of content, will be useful and used by you, and I just pray your blessing as we go through it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Um, so this is, again, um, you've, got, you've got my little chart on the top there. I'm not going to belabor the particulars of it too much, except that it's the whole of what, I, what I'm hoping we'll learn from all of this. The inner circle is, without the red, the black part is kind of very historic and very accepted, and it is the basic diagrammatical representation of the historical Reformation orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, the three in one. And as we've talked about in other classes, that's caused a lot of difficulty for some, and, and good people as well as evil-minded people wind up misunderstanding who God is and don't really perhaps recognize or appreciate how much what we believe about who God is sets the tone for understanding who we are and by extension everything around us. And so what I wanted to do with this is, and, and again, the, this diagram, I, I'm going to keep hammering it because I don't want to be burned a heretic is a bit of a, of a kind of an amplification of that original doctrine to kind of apply it more into the world that we see. And it's not my work. I'm, I, I drew the diagram, but I'm leaning so heavily upon um, some men that I respect mightily in, in scholarly things, Jeff Myers and Ralph Smith and Peter Lightheart and, and Doug Jones and, and numbers of others that I've never met. But those are men that I have met and men that I... I look up to greatly, and but they're imperfect, and it's possible to come to a wrong understanding. And so I, I guess I kind of came to this thought, forgive me for, for where my mind goes sometimes, but, but I see this diagram as a bit like a, a sock turned halfway inside out. On the inside is what we historically agreed the Trinity is, is the, the whole one and three aspect of it, and the part that's kind of turned inside out and folded over is how that spills out into the outside part of the world where where we live. And and so there, there's a way in which I hope that this takes something that is to the point of being dogmatically true that we would we've accepted across millennia now and turns it in a direction, maybe turns it out inside out a little bit where we're looking at that truth that we've all established that we understand about the Trinity and drawn nice neat lines of orthodoxy around it and identified heresies when it tiptoes outside of the line or monkeys with the stuff that's inside and um, and, it, and it, it looks at the whole creation the, the whole idea of the, the Trinitarian interplay and intercourse with creation and redemption so that's kind of what that whole thing is. 
Now, the reason it's at the top of your page, and we're not really going to be talking about it, is you can kind of keep as we go through these things, referring back to it and see, test it to see if it fits um, what we're what we're going to. But what we're yes, yes Bob. I was trying to read. What you had yeah, because I I yeah. I apologize. I will maybe not get so cheap with my printer ink and give you a bigger per version of it. Um, I don't have a slide of it this time that I can put up. It's just a small, you know, where you have the sun and the red. Yeah, it's, but it's what we've talked about before, where the red is basically the idea how the spirit and the sun. But what does it say there? Right? Okay, together, all, all, the, all the fine print on the inside. You already know the Father, the Son. Yeah. Okay. But the red, draw, uh, the red arrows are meant to be how the, the various pairings of the person. Look at you with your magnifying glass. Like that's going to help. It's pixelated. That's a little yeah. <laughs> Together gives us. Together give us. Give us two. Because you can't see the two is in the arrow. That's why. To the Spirit, like say the Father and the Son together give us to the Spirit as temples in which to dwell. The, 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 the Son and the Spirit together give us to the Father as adopted sons and daughters. The Father and the Spirit together give us to the Son as his bride. That's literally all that said. But I, I guess my question is, why do you have to go through all that? I mean, because we're trying to see how that fundamental truth about the Trinity affects uh, because the outer circle the red circle is is outside of eternity it's in creation right so it's we're trying to see with our finite fallen eyes how does any of this truth about the 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 objective truth about the trinity affect us that's that's all that's meant to do which is why this is dangerous and you might still burn me a heretic Bob. no no it'll be today no. i hope it does yeah. okay so where we're at today is kind of trying to look at is are the are the ancient heresies still among us? Is there still a problem with that? And and so you know where we're at here is we're going to move into an introduction where this this there's a problem with the threeness and the oneness of the Trinity as one author that we're going to spend some time today has discussed it and it and it's always been where man stumbles this this trickiness of the threeness and the oneness um, in the Trinity because no matter how many times we recite the truth we never seem to simply accept it we, we like I did it this drawing is it it's like not happy to just say oh there's the Trinity over there but wanting trying to apply it um, we it's too easy to step over lines and so that's that's kind of where we're going to go here with this so by way of introduction we're going to look at what we've already talked about. And there are some fundamental truths here that I want to bring to your mind. Historically speaking, the Trinity, um, and this is again, as we were before when we were studying some of the notable Trinitarian heresies and the various ways in which the church historically um, united to address them, is not necessarily the paradigm that we have going on in the world today. Historically speaking, the Trinity was of an immense importance in establishing a plumb line for orthodoxy upon which all other doctrines were established. The one thing that you can see in all of the, the creeds that came out of the various councils and colloquies and assemblies of the divines for centuries, the, the one thing they were trying to defend more than anything else was a right understanding of, of the Trinity because they understood that it was a, a, a plumb line. You, you build a, you, you want to know what vertical is, you draw a plumb line. You want to, you, it, and every, every angle that is, goes into a building is established upon one fundamental vertical plumb line of truth. And so the church historically recognized the importance of a doctrine of the Trinity. Also, historically speaking, a correct doctrinal understanding of the Trinity was of paramount importance. It wasn't just this thing where somebody said, oh, this is an important thing. We need to, we need to draw a line and put, uh, erect an, uh, another Ebenezer monument someplace. It was something that was live, living in and pulsing in. And it was something that, that was reiterated over and over again 
in every doctrinal understanding. It was a it was a very important thing for for our uh, forebears to have to have understood, and it set a, a tone in everything that they taught. Um, and I, in a way, I said that the ancient paths were always then delineated by a, the church's central doctrine about the Trinity. To the ancient Christians, those from the the church the beginning of the church age, historically speaking, the Trinity defined everything. It was of primary importance. Now that didn't stay that way because now we are living in this modern age where modern evangelical Christianity tends to minimize or completely overlook the importance of having any kind of a doctrine at all regarding the Trinity. It's just something that is um, not important to most, most individual in, you know, evangelicals. We've been kind of trained to question old doctrines to say things that are idiotic like no creed but christ which is itself a creed um and 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 to try to to sweep away all of the all of the scholarship all of the work that was done in history modern evangelicalism is all about the feeling it's all about my perspective it has very few plumb lines and absolutes from which everything else is drawn. And, and so this is the world that we live in today. We have this, this situation where neither is a, a, a doctrine of the Trinity of any kind of paramount importance, especially in various systems of faith practice. You, you have to look long and hard to find writings of modern evangelicals uh, authors on on the doctrine of the Trinity that they might give a kind of a, a throwaway acknowledgement of somebody that's gone before as though you're going to just accept the whole corpus of Spurgeon's work for instance and never go back and look into it and, and ask any questions so they pretend to lean upon and stand upon the shoulders of the greats that came before them but they don't put a lot of effort into um, doing anything about it. So, in other words, if we're to judge the modern evangelical, and I'm lumping everybody in a bin here, the modern evangelical's faith by the place that the doctrine of the Trinity holds in their published works, we're not going to be reading for very long, and we're certainly not going to enter into much depth of thought at all. In a sense, the modern Christian's attention span in matters of the Trinity is about as long as a short tweet on social media with a lot of characters left over. They just don't spend any time on the subject. Is that because of the attention span? <laughs> it's, I'm sure it's a lot of things like that, Judy. Um, was there a moment in time when this began to happen? I don't, I think it was pro, I don't, I don't know. I could probably, I probably have opinions on the subject, but I can't say objectively. I think that um, I, I, I blame a lot of the, the sloppiness and the laziness of scholarship and doctrinally upon that, that movement of, of, the, of Arminius taking over the, the, the Reformation after it was all done and a, and a fascination again with man's free will and, and God's not being sovereign, but somehow man's, man's will holds sway over God's, which is if you cut away a lot of that. It's that, but that's always been there. That wasn't new. That that's something that um, that that August, Augustine argued with Pelagius about, and that's things that Paul and all the apostles argued about in their their times. It's it, it's it's written large all throughout Scripture. I guess it started with Adam. When when you believe the well, did did God really say? Is God really the definer of what's true? Um, and man starts becoming his own adjudicator of truth, that's going to go someplace. If it's not restrained, it's going to go someplace. Having to have an understanding of a God that's bigger than you, that's smarter than you, that's in control of everything, including brush fires and shootings in bars and everything else, is something that doesn't go down easily for, for men. We want to put it in our own terms, we want to be able to blame God. We want to say, oh, he's not fair. If I were running things, it would be better. That, and I think that's sort of an unrestrained 
thought process that fallen man has always had, and it just stops being as restrained. And they're not finding anybody on the media to answer those questions. Well, there are, there are. I mean, I'm not when I when I threw all of the evangelicals in a bucket. That includes us in this room, and I don't think we fit that mold exactly. But it's it's a remnant so it's in evangelicalism. World, I'm talking about what the world is hearing on the media. They don't hear any, any good answers to those questions. It's true. Because everybody, everything's squishy. Last last week when we were closed because you couldn't get here, um, my wife and I went to church with our daughter and son-in-law and our son and his girlfriend. And I won't mention the church, but it was in the Caneo Valley and it was reeling with the, the borderline bar and grill shooting as well as the fires. And they the, the, the pastor was kind of trying to make this appeal to um, to the congregation, but it was all about, you know, emotiveness he, he he actually went to to the the concept of lament but lament that wasn't connected to the next thought he, he was quoting jeremiah and lamentations and that was kind of the and it, this was by the way coordinated all across the pastors of the caneo valley and all the arminian churches and it was the idea that you're hurting and it wasn't connected to well maybe you should ask some deep questions if God's sovereign and this is happening around me, what am I supposed to learn from this? Is God not still sovereign? Was there, was there a purpose for this? Like in Lamentations, there's a sadness about the destruction of Jerusalem, but it doesn't last very long before the corners turned and it was like, okay, God's judging us for something. What did we do? What can we do better? How do we, we you run towards God and not away from him. But what I was hearing in that congregation was a whole lot of touchy feely break up into groups and cry over here and there's boxes of tissue at the end of the, and if you want to do something meaningful, go down to the monument down there at the, at the borderline grill at grill and clog up the traffic for all the neighbors in the community so that you can just be there and help somebody emote. It, it, it wasn't connected to anything bigger than, than us. That's the way modern evangelicalism reacts to, to trials and crises. We have no excuse. We know better. Yes, Judy. Just as a way of encouragement, I went to a church in Reseda Valley where they were on Ephesians 5, strangely at least. Great. And they were talking about praising the Lord. The whole congregation at the very end is saying, all is well with my soul. And I've never heard a more... Oh, we sang that, but somehow it had a different timbre to it. <laughs> but it was... Um, I mean, it was the most moving moment. And I've had, had a long time in a church. Yeah. And everybody was praising God. Well, it's great. Because it was the sermon was centered on God is still sovereign. We can uh, all is well with our soul, and it was. And you know what? I think that's the right reaction to have is to, to is to turn it away from yourself as right. fast as possible, and either say, okay, if this is God giving me a spank, and what did I go to the woodshed for? What do I need to do better? Thank you, Lord, for correcting me. Let's move on. How can I serve you? And then being of some use. Um, to turning outward, you know, is this is this trial that I'm going through preparing me for a bigger trial for myself, or <coughs> or or is it making me better able to help that other person over there through theirs? But it's always it should always be something that points back to God and the true God, not some false idolized, built up out of spare parts kind of God that really is more like God built in our image than we in His. So that's, that's kind of where we're all at. So modern evangelicalism as a whole is still tap dancing with some of these old heresies. So we're back here to this idea that then there's no, there's no way in which the scholarship of modern evangelicalism is trying to fight against a tendency among the people as pastors should be telling all of us, no, 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 that's the wrong way to look at this. God is still God. God is bigger than this. There's a reason even if we can't see it. Being pastoral does not necessarily mean crawling into the sin with somebody to make them feel good about themselves and, and or, or whatever's going on, to, to being consumed with the lament on its face, not what the what the reason behind it is for a legitimate lament i mean you're not like anybody's saying well put a smiley face on everything we all walk around behind a mask and there's no there's no frowns there's no sadness there's no tears there's no praying there's no appealing there's no pleading 
That all that should take place. But if it's an appeal to a false god, then it's something that needs to be corrected. And even though the, the bucket load of our peers in modern evangelicalism kind of are doing that, Neither are those who should be their beacons, those who should be sounding the klaxon to correct that thought, the ones who are the modern writers, most of them are also not spending much time on the Trinity at all. For most modern American evangelical scholars, having any sort of formal or developed doctrine of the Trinity is, if it exists at all, it's a secondary issue. And except for how a few writers, and I, I would put in that um, James Sire, Francis Schaeffer, uh, Ronald Nash, R.C. Sproul, Gary DeMar, do have some doctrinal statements about the Trinity, and they do include the Trinity as having um, an important or even possibly essential role in, in an individual's personal worldview. Very little uh, beyond what you think about the Trinity or what you should know about the Trinity is done at all. The, the pulpits don't resound with trying to take a Trinitarian knowledge or an understanding and build a Trinitarian aesthetic, build a tr Trinitarian liturgy of worship, build a Trinitarian-centered community, a worldview, a corporate way in which we should all be doing something with that part of the dominion that we've been, uh, the dominion mandate, that part of the world that we've been called to make better, to build better. And so what we're left with is that very, very few people worry about the Trinity. It's a secondary thought. Even fewer write about it. And most of the ones that do make it about you. So it's all still kind of going back to how we individuals have a Trinitarian uh, understanding, a Trinitarian ethic, a Trinitarian ethos. But it's not something that is any more, as I say, think it should be, exploding out of our mouths. The, the motive behind everything that we say when we witness to somebody, what our church's reaction in a community ought to be, how our preachers think and feel when they go to the pulpit what's burning in their souls what's what's in the low bottoms of their heart that they just have to share is it a passion for the truth about god or is it about something else and so that's what i'm hoping we get out of this and what i'm really kind of hoping we can use the rest of our time with after today is trying to look at how do we apply what's true about God, how do we try to fill out that outer red circle of possible heresy of mine on the diagram? How do we, as not just individuals, how do we as a church, how do we as families, how do we as a community, how do we as Christendom approach the world? How do we build a Trinitarian aesthetic? How do we live in a Trinitarian um, eschatology? And by that, I don't mean a view of the end days, although that's part of it. I mean, how do Christians in the church age conduct ourselves in, in all of the, the ways in which we do? Is the Trinity still a plumb line uh, for everything that we do? Is it a, is it a motive of, of every doctrine we look at? It's something that we should be excited about instead of just going, oh, hey, fits in a chart, fits in a checklist, chart, 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 we're done. You know, so far so good. And and, and we're all TR, remember that one? Um, because we have the right Trinitarian understanding, but we don't do anything with it. It's a, it's a tool that rusts in the toolbox. Have we lost the vision for building the kingdom? Well, is that, I, is that part of it? I think it is. Yeah. And I think that's a part of what I'm saying we might find as the more of a motive for fixing that right. is it, it shouldn't come out of oh hey most studies show that if you can sell the church on its music or its prayer ministry or, or or its youth ministry or whatever then you've got it knocked and you're everything you should be in the community no what you believe about god what you believe about what god requires of us what you believe about how god expects us to be bearers of his image individually 
And what he wants his bride to look like in the world is how we should be motivated to do this. Now, I, I kind of hope we'll have a chance. And again, this this is where I got to hold myself back because this could stretch into like a year long thing. And you'd all be sleeping by the time I was done because I get kind of riled about this. It occurred to me that there's actually kind of a way in which we don't even look at our Bibles and the way they're structured in a Trinitarian way. There's there's a so clearly, to me, categorized system where whole portions of our Bible paint a picture of God our Father in all the patriarchal languages and all of the all of the the correcting and, and chastising and and adopting and all of that kind of stuff. And then there's a whole way in which, and the whole sacrificial system. And then there's this whole portending of, of the sacrifice once for all that would undo the sin of, of Adam. This whole portending of an anticipation of the coming of the bridegroom. And this whole way in which you look at the history of the church, it starts with, with an unfaithful, idolatrous woman tramp that's made into this lovely beautiful creature by the washing and water and the word by our bridegroom that's in there there's a whole sense in which the whole new testament is really a kind of a an opening up of the church age where the spirit is sent to dwell within us and so you've got the the working out in shown to us in scripture of some of this stuff of where there's fatherly ways in which the Bible is is screaming at us and bridegroom ways in which the Bible screams at us and temple ways in which the, the Bible screams to us. But we're also quick to say, oh, it's there's we're going to look at this dispensationally. That one ended. This one started. Oh, sin was a surprise to God. Oh, Jesus is plan B. Oh, well, the spirit, maybe God, maybe not, you know, and, and, and oh, the, oh, it's all going to come to a quick end. What if it doesn't? What if we're still looking at 100,000 years of earth history before the, 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 the final trumpet blows? Why aren't we living that way? Why aren't we living like those virgins keeping the, the lamps filled and the wicks trimmed? Why aren't we like the... The, the, the keepers of that feast, inviting as many as will come in, as long as we have, we have no idea who will come. We have no idea who's elect. Why aren't we living our evangelical lives? Why isn't the, the, the motivation for the whole church for the, what our worship looks like? Why aren't we coming to the table when it's offered? Why aren't we screaming for it to be, why are we having it every week? Why are, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to create problems here, but why? Why do we settle in the ways that we settle for a stodgy, minimalist way of what church is? Why aren't we dreaming big and then trying to act on it? Why aren't we pushing? You know, we got maybe we're in a car with an engine that's got some problems. Why aren't we all out pushing it up the hill? Why aren't we more Trinitarian in the way we see the world, the way we interact with the world, and the way that um, we look forward to to the world going, and I need to get off my soapbox again. <laughs> we're, we're so used to the way we are now. Exactly. Well, we, have no, we have no vision of what we, when we made thy, thy kingdom come, we have no idea what we're talking Correct. about. Correct. We just need to get back to the place where some sort of a robust Trinitarian doctrine is driving or directing our corporate worship as well as, as um, our ecclesial view of the the way things are, and and, and the, where if you try to in, insert that thought, or even a try to trace of that thought, personally, I felt there's very few people that are even interested. I don't know or know what I'm trying to say, right. even as poor as I would be saying it. Well, but again, you, you people aren't the problem. You're here. You're here to listen to the kernels of truth that might fall out of my mouth. And look at the stuff that I put in front of you because you have an interest in learning a better way. And quite honestly, my dream is that every one of you will want to stand up and teach something more and deeper and better. Because that's what we should all be doing. This should be an iron sharpening iron, which means that we all come out of this better. Not just heat and filings on the floor. Okay? So, now, just so you don't think this is just me ranting about the condition of modern evangelicalism... 
there are a couple of um, I, I mentioned that part already. You need to have a the, or in the modern evangelical world, there's just not a call to have a robust Trinitarian doctrine. Now, but there are a couple of authors. These are very, I don't know, obscure people. I found them quoted by uh, Ralph Smith in uh, a book of his that I wanted to bring to you that's just kind of emblematic of the attitude even in the modern evangelical church about a doctrine of the Trinity. The first one is a guy named Jürgen Moltmann who wrote a book called The Trinity and the Kingdom in 1981. And he asks the rhetorical question, why are most Christians in the West, whether they be Catholics or Protestants, really only monotheists where the experience and practice of the faith is concerned? Uh, no. Whether God is one or triune evidently makes as little difference to the doctrine of faith as it does to ethics. In other words, the doctrine of what's inside of you versus what you do. Consequently, the doctrine of the Trinity hardly occurs at all in modern apologetic writings, which aim to bring the Christian faith home to the modern world again. Even new approaches made by fundamental theology do not begin with the Trinity. And they should. Why don't they? This is ratifying the point I just made here. And there's another one. This guy's going to blow your mind. Now, this guy is actually kind of primarily talking to the Roman Catholic Church, but it, it does apply. His name is Karl Rahner, and he wrote another book called The Trinity in 1970. And he says, we must be willing to admit that should the doctrine of the Trinity have to be dropped as false, the major part of religious literature could well remain virtually unchanged. In other words, what should be the foundation of the building and you pull it out and the building falls apart, you should be able to play Django with it, yank it out and everything else still stands. That's sad and it's true. The way most of the modern religious literature is written, where the, the Trinity is just completely overlooked or secondary, it's not the skeleton. You pull the skeleton out of a chicken, you got a blob of feathers and, you know, you, you need something to, oh, I don't know where that came from. I, <laughs> I got it. Yeah, I don't, that's a bell you can't unring either. I don't always have that. So. Imagine them trying to move around. The, never mind. Uh, so it just doesn't matter. And that's sad. So, um, but, the, but the problem we have is that having that, it's a critical thing to maintain. If we don't have at the beginning and the middle and the end of everything we write about and think about and preach about, if you can't see the Trinity somehow displayed in it, you're kind of wandering off the path and you're in danger of falling into a ditch. So let's get to talking about today and I we call this I'm, I'm borrowing from this uh, other author here that we're going to be dealing with in a minute he's calling it the the, the oneness or threeness and I call it the great divide because I kind of think it's still looking at the if you looked at all of those Trinitarian heresies that we looked at in, in history they split down the middle of a misunderstanding of who the one God is and who the three persons in the Godhead are. And, and so there's two different views of that that are still um, being talked about today. And there's a, a way in which, um, a, a rather profound way in which um, all these ancient Trinitarian heresies still abound in many of the theological debates that do occur about the Trinity. Um, so there was this one 20th century um, theologian named Cornelius Plantinga. And it's kind of interesting because if you look at the writing, especially in the book that I got it, the Cornelius Plantinga, I don't, I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. Maybe the accent is on the wrong syllable. I don't know. But the his, his, his foil, the counter point guy that I really look up to um, for a lot of things is also named Cornelius and it was Cornelius Van Til. So Van Til and, and Plantinga kind of had this 
you know, coin flip opposite view thing. And I'm not, we're not going to be talking about Van Til today, but Cornelius Plantinga wrote this article, um, and I couldn't find the citation for it. It might have been like a dissertation or something like that that's kind of hard to find except in stodgy back rooms of seminary someplace. I don't know. Apparently it's well known. And he wrote this article called The Threeness Oneness Problem of the Trinity. And in this article, he sought to summarize what he considered to be the central conceptual problem in the doctrine of the Trinity that bristles with problems and questions. And again, it's the oneness and the threeness. So the ancient heresies, the ancient creeds um, didn't settle it. It's still kind of going on today. And I hope you're holding your nose for the smoke, not my... my okay. okay. <laughs> Keep them guessing. I should have a thing. Would you like to borrow? I have a. You're no, welcome. No, I, I could go get a mask, but I don't want to miss anything. Okay. <laughs> it's so Did profound. <laughs> so, this guy sought to summarize these. The, he 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 was trying to address the debate, and I'm not going to try to come down on what his view of it was, his conclusions about it, but I thought it was really interesting the way he defined that debate. But in his mind, the central problem of the oneness and the threeness dwarfs all of the other problems connected with the Trinity. And I think creedally, that's, historically, that's true. That that the, the, the creeds were addressing heresies at various times that attack the oneness of God and the threeness of God. It's a paradox. It, it is a paradox. And again, it's because we got to take God at his word because we can't fit it in our little finite boxes. And, and so, but we keep trying. And that's what's still going on. And so he, in my mind, rightly recognized that this problem um, contains some profound implications for how we form other doctrines today. It's, it's still a central doctrine and it's profoundly impacts all of that. So what he said was um, that there's a particular or peculiar statement of the doctrine of the Trinity will, for the sake of coherence, compel adjustments in nearly all other doctrinal areas. So he's, he's actually going back to the original understanding that if you don't have a particular or a peculiar statement of the doctrine of the Trinity that's right, everything's going to crumble. But you're going to have an understanding about the Trinity no matter what's going on. And um, whatever you believe is going to compel what you believe about everything else to be adjusted. And I would say made more false or more true. So does he believe in the Trinity? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So far... So good. So then Plantinga identified that there are these two opposing camps in the threeness and the oneness debate, as he called it. Well, why did you say oneness? Uh, because the, the, the understanding of the one God in three persons, so the right. oneness and the threeness. And so he was just saying that whatever you believe about it, it about that doctrine, you're going to have a doctrine, and, it, and it's right or it's wrong. And whatever you believe, it's going to affect everything else that you that you teach. He's just basically uh, amplifying what we've already said. So he then identifies these two opposing camps in this threeness, oneness debate. And he identified Karl Barth and his followers as representing one side of the, mono, uh, the modern Trinitarian debate, or, or the, uh, that is the oneness doctrine. And um, he... He's not saying that they that Karl Barth is that was the example that he chose because he was um, you know well known very well written and documented and there's a lot of very astute followers of his so he picked Karl Barth and his followers to be representative of one side of that debate and he he believes that they represent the oneness side of all of this and then he also in Plantinga's mind the so-called social Trinitarians, and don't, don't lose your mind to what social means in this, it's not what you think, but the social Trinitarians represented the threeness doctrine, and we'll, we'll expound on that in just a minute. So Plantinga 
defined this problem of oneness and threeness in these terms. There's a quote. Suppose the divine life includes both a three and a one. What are the reference of these numbers? Three what? And one what? It's a good question. Three what and one what? You're going to talk about three persons, one God, three. How do we define the what in, in, in that? So he um, postulated that Barth's answer would have been that God's threeness consisted in modes of being. Now you can start beginning in your mind to pull terms out from a few weeks ago. He's going to go someplace with this understanding of modes of, of being. You've got to keep referring to what you have on your, on your outline versus what my teaching notes say. Uh, okay. So Barth's answer to this question about one what and three what would be that God's oneness was said to be in his personhood. That God is only one personality, which is his one active speaking divine ego. And the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are that one. And then furthermore, um, Barth would have postulated that if we should ascribe personhood in the full modern sense of the term personhood to each of the three persons, we would have what he believed would amount to un unmitigated tritheism. So in Barth's understanding of what the threeness doctrine of God represented was that you would have to use a modern understanding of what personhood is, which in, in his understanding, that modern definition of personhood is a self-conscious subject, a center of action, knowledge, love, and person. So it would tend to be um, three individual gods, which would, in his mind, be tritheism. In that sense, Karl Barth, according to Plantinga, can be said to represent the oneness doctrine of the Trinity, and um, I, I need to point out that some people have claimed, um, Plantinga and Cornelius Van Til, the other side of it, that um, Barth could have been considered to be a modalist, which is one of the heresies we talked about before, where you, you somehow diminish the persons as being modes of the one God. And so, and, and there's a lot of ink spilled on both sides of that argument about whether Barth was a modalist or not. But for the sake of Plantinga's discussion here, I, I, I think he's presuming that the oneness doctrine as espoused by, by Barth was a modalist understanding. The oneness doctrine then is a modalist understanding. Another modern theologian, a guy named Leonard Hodgson, argued that the threeness question cannot be solved with references to modes in God. And I, I think that, that he's actually um, right about that. That the, to him, the three are distinct persons in the full sense of that word. And so they're still playing around with the understanding of what personhood means. But there's a little bit of a, a disagreement about what the full sense of that is. And so he referred, he, Hodgson, referred to the three persons as three intelligent, purposive centers of consciousness. So he tended to go in the direction of making them individual entities of God and not they're still going back and forth about the one and the three. They're not letting it be both. They're not being happy with the paradox. They've got to solve the paradox. And so in Plantinga's mind, this was the social doctrine of the Trinity, which views God as, and this is what the social, is a society 
in God, consisting of three truly distinct persons. Basically, three gods got together and decided to be one god one day. And, and so that that's kind of... That sounds pretty tricky. It does a little tricky. So why do you think I'm so nervous when I hand you diagrams? It's it's what, what you can do with that. So um, then, in this sense, Leonard Hodgson can be said to represent the threeness doctrine of the Trinity. So then Plantinga circles back and he asks, then, how many gods does God comprise? This is He's going back to trying to be the, the guy looking at both sides of this. And he says, the Barthian oneness doctrine answer is that God is one person. There's not one God in three persons. There's one God in one person. The Hodgsonian or social Trinitarian understanding of the threeness doctrine answer is that God is fully, three fully distinct persons. We're back to the same argument that was raging before some of the councils that gave us the, uh, the, the creeds. So, and I believe that in this sense, and objectively, I think that whether he went all the way over, whether either of these guys went all the way over, maybe this was just uh, devil's advocacy going on for rhetorical debate, I don't know. But you could say that if Plantinga's assessment of these guys is right, that Barth teetered on modalism and Hodgson teetered on tritheism. And so then, therefore, all of that needs to be carefully looked at. These are modern theologians with a lot of, you know, a lot of people have read Barth, and I presume a lot of people have read Hodgson, and there's probably some good stuff that they have to say. But if their understanding of the Trinity is off, then you need to be careful what you do with all the rest of it. And so that's the other thing I want to say here is about the scholarship of any individual, including me when I handle you a drawing. Question what that person's understanding of who God is. Every single discernment of every book you read on something minimally has that one screaming thing that, that you should be asking yourself when you read the book, when you listen to the to the tape or the CD or the whatever it is these days, the podcast, whatever you whatever you let go into your ears and eyes um, and, and are beginning to trickle down into your heart and what you think about something, always ask that one question. What is the, is the slip showing there a little bit? What does this person think about who God is? Is there a, a right Trinitarian understanding being espoused in what's being said that I'm hearing? And so, yeah. Could I add that you also include the publisher and the uh, and the author's seminarian experience? Well, I'm, I'm not going to go in the direction of... I, I would say, if somebody's gone... I'm, I'm, this is how skeptical I am about this. If a guy's gone to a seminary, I, yes, I'm going to look at what the seminary is about because I don't trust seminaries. Right. There, there's a kind of a joke you call them cemeteries. That's why I think you should. Okay? Because they're, they, they're like every university. They, they come with a little but side some, order of... But some you can cross off immediately. Well, sure. But I think all of them you need to, you need to question. Right. I, I, I honestly... I, I this agree. is my non-Presbyterian side coming out, okay? I sincerely... I don't trust any man, okay? And any man who stands up to preach and teach ought to be questioned and ought to be... Have, he ought to feel the heat. Me too. Okay, right. so that, that's, I'm including I'm myself. Great. But I, I think there's an overemphasis on the, on the quality or the, the efficacy or the requirement of having had a terminal degree from a, from a seminary to make you qualified to preach or to teach. In my mind, it's more the scholarship of the man. It's more the, the experience of the man. You can't take some 20-year-old kid and send him through a, a liberal, liberal arts college or education or whatever, and then send him off to a less liberal seminary and have him come out the other side and he's qualified to go in and tell some couple that's been married for 30 years how to, how to make their marriage right. Exactly. Or, or do anything. It's a, it's a wisdom. It's a, there, there's a certain amount of... I, I way more trust the hoary-headed men 
that are older. <laughs> well, that's a good thing in the Bible, and it's actually a good term. It just means gr the gray beards, okay? And I'm not saying that because I are one. I, I'm, I'm saying that I think that, that a maturity and a life, an old saint, is a better counselor than a fresh, wet-behind-the-ears seminary graduate. And I'll put that across the board. Now, a lot of those people get the call, and they get put, my nephew's one of them, got put in front of a church that basically some other guy built, and he's he's just given this thing that he never had to work for. It's like handing a 20-year-old a, a kid a massive inheritance. Is he going to buy a Corvette? You know, is what do, what do you do with that? Now, that doesn't mean that it can't be done right, but it's 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 got to be more deliberate. It's got to be more of trying to discern the ancient paths. It's way more about standing on the shoulders of great men. Your seminary, your, your library should be filled with dead guys who had a life that you can see the whole life and you can... That's why to me, I honestly, I said it to Bob this morning, when I heard about the fire bearing down on this place, my thought was, how do we save pastor's library? That's the most valuable thing in this building. So, because that's to me where, where wisdom comes from. It comes from from looking for what's ancient and true and starting there. Building on it, I mean, I did that with this stupid diagram. I'm trying to, I'm trying to say, do something with what you think that inner circle says. Part of that women's study right now is listen to the older women and listen to the older men. Exactly, exactly. In fact, that's the end of our, yes. our thing there. Because yeah. the Athanasian Creed answer to Plantinga's question is... Part 15, so the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. Ancient creed for the win. You know, it's interesting. You know, we're studying in the Old Testament and the CSF and uh, looking at uh, 1 Samuel right now. <laughs> but what's interesting, though, is to look at the Trinity in the Old Testament. Exactly. Thank you. And it's there. Yeah, it's there, but you know, you got to look for it. You do. Because God likes to hide in plain sight, like we've talked about. And I think another thing that's interesting, too, is we talked what? about Adam in the Garden no, of Eden. Eden. I'm reading? No. You oh, we should say something. We don't Sorry. have a screen. Excuse me. Well, we're, we're done anyway. We're just going to close in prayer. So, what, you know, and what's and the, the uh, you know, how does this Trinity work in the Garden of Eden? It just seems like it's God the Father. It's there. It's all pictures of the whole thing. It, it really I mean, is. he's there, but sure. I mean, there's no, there's no uh, interaction, so to speak. Thank you. Well, there is. I think there is. It's, you don't see three persons walking with Adam in the cool of the day. Um, you see the representation of the Father, but there's still the promise. There's still an aspect in which Eden itself was a, was a, a place where it was an entering into. They didn't. Nobody had to earn their way into the Garden of Eden. They were put into it, and it was a worshipful, yeah. temple-like kind of thing. The first Adam was a type of the second, a promise of that which would save. When the first one failed, there's there's so much of us pictured in Adam, the first Adam in the Garden that that fell. But it it begs the question of where's Where's the consummation? Where's the fulfillment? Where's where's the completion of this? It's all it's all there, but you have to be able to look at it with the presumption that it's there, and looking to see is it is it sort of hidden in the shadows? Is it sort of typed in this person? Is it sort of the 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 kind of a parabolic uh, concentration of many things? Is it a, a is it a a, a a, 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 um, a metaphor of somehow it's all there. Yeah, it's there, but it, and also evil is there. You know, it's Correct. Correct. But that, well, yeah. did you have a question, Mara? Yeah. You didn't hold your hand up. <laughs> he, he called out a turn. <laughs> <laughs> These people you're quoting, mm -hmm. were, you say they're modern. Mm -hmm. What is modern? Is um, twentieth century. Oh. Barth, yeah, this earlier on, but and but in you know the, the Cornelius um, Plantinga, I have no idea um, where he's at. Van Van Til's gone. Um, 
Heart is gone. See how the evolution of those is coming to practice in the oh, yeah. today. Oh yeah, because you know, quite honestly, some of these men were seminary professors. And we don't know what their background was to get to what their mindset was when they went into this. I, I yeah, I, I think so. I, but again, I, I'm a big believer in the accountability of the local church. And sometimes when you, it's like when you, when parents raise, look at the, this these days, the perfect example is parents raise children with a set of values, and then they turn them out and turn them over to some liberal university to educate them, and they come back snowflakes. Well, churches raise young men, and they grow up in the midst of them, and they are the repository of of wisdom and maturity and examples of not to follow as well all around them. And a church sends them out to a seminary and they come back believing all kinds of liberal ideas that aren't biblical. I, I think the, the I think there should part of this is always the heaven and this is where the creeds come in. They're an accountability section for us. The the church should be the accountability partner of every student in a seminary. Like the parents should be to every student in a in a out in a, a educational kind of a thing someplace else, and it just doesn't happen. It's not a there's no connectedness. It's all like oh hey these are free agents and well this one will cherry it out. It's not a it's not a, a a familial growing organic kind of a thing anymore, which I think a trinitarian understanding will 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 beg and will foster and will inspire. But again, we gotta start with the basics. And I think the basics are believing God to be who God says God is. And we just try to figure out how we fit into that paradigm. So, well, we need to shut down. And Bob, I'm gonna ask you if you would, did you have something you wanted to say? Other than praying? Other than praying. Okay. Father God, we give you praise and glory, Lord. We thank you again for this time. We thank you for John's work, Lord. We thank you for, the uh, the uh, Ephesian Creed answer that Father is God, Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet they're all three, but yet there are not three gods, but one God. And we thank you for that, Lord. We ask that you be with us as we now partake in a, a church and listen to Pastor Bob present the sermon today. Jesus' name, amen. 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 So again.